Um, our next uh, speaker this afternoon is going to be talking about the role of uh, photonics in uh, food and um, the uh, challenges that, that uh, photonics tackles in terms of uh, food safety. His, uh, his name is Richard Crocombe uh, and uh, his education is uh, originally in chemistry and spectroscopy at Oxford University in the UK um, and then his PhD from the University of Southampton. Uh, his industrial career has focused for more than 30 years on product development and commercialization of new technologies and uh, their applications. For the past 15 years, he's worked uh, on handheld and portable spectroscopic instruments, X-ray fl fluorescence, near-infrared, mid-infrared, Raman, and gas chromatography with mass spectrometry. He's worked for several major analytical uh, companies like Thermo Fisher and uh, Perkin Elmer. And uh, he's also active in several professional societies. He's actually a co-chair of one of our uh, conferences which was running uh, yesterday, the Next Generation Spectroscopic Technologies. Um, and uh, he received the Williams uh, Wright Award for Industrial, Industrial Spectroscopy in 2013. Uh, he was also guest editor for Applied Spectroscopy in May of 2016, an issue that was concentrating on uh, portable spectroscopy. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Richard Crocombe. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. um, I guess I'll stand over here. Um, so much, girls. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is um, that, that there are sort of three major topics here. There's what is food fraud? How can near-infrared spectroscopy help? What near, more importantly, what near-infrared spectroscopy can do and what it can't do. And then a little overview of miniature and handheld instruments and engines that, that, that are available today, and many of them are um, around on the floor. Um, I hope you've had lunch, because I'm going to start worrying you about uh, the food that you eat at this point. Um, there are some recent books on food fraud, and I just highlighted a couple of these. Um, the one on the right is um, an 800-page monograph that goes through by technique, by analytical technique, analytical technique, what it can do um, for food, and then goes through various types of food, um, talking about how those analytical techniques apply to that food and what's been found over the years. And so it's a very comprehensive scientific monograph. The one on the left, sorting the beef from the bull, um, is, is, is written at a somewhat more popular level, but one of the authors is a professor of analytical chemistry and a fellow of the uh, Royal Society, and the other author um, is a science writer. So it goes into lots and lots of the cases of, of um, food fraud um, that have happened um, recently. Um, if you want to, you know, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find a lot of stuff. There's a good article in The Atlantic about 18 months ago. Um, which actually summarizes a lot of details. And so I've taken some of the pictures from, from, from that article. So this talks about the most common types of um, adulteration in food, um, substitution and dilution being the largest, um, um, un um, inappropriate additives, etc. And then look at the reported incidents. And you may not realize this, the single most um, um, adulterated or counterfeited food is um, olive oil. There's a lot of stuff going on in vegetable oils. Milk um, is the second. Um, not, not so much in the US and Western Europe, but certainly in the rest of the world. Um, honey, and, and I'll actually talk about honey um, in a moment. That, that might not be one that comes to mind for you. Spices, a lot of counterfeiting, a lot of adulteration in spices. And then um, coffee, um, passing off coffee beans from one, from one geography um, as, as coffee beans from a higher value geography, uh, you know, as an example, um, and even down to cheese. And th so there's a lot of this. Each year, the economic impact of this is estimated as $15 billion. So this is not a trivial thing. This is a major, this is a major issue with a major um, economic impact um, around the world. And, and the amount of stuff that's seized is, is, um, um, is quite amazing. You can see that in Europe. Um, uh, 20,000 tons and 420,000 gallons of counterfeit of su uh, substandard food and drink. Um, and it, it talks about some of the things. Uh, frozen, 
Frozen fish thawed and spritzed with chemicals to look fresh, mozzarella made from expired milk and smoked in the back of a van, and vodka laced with antifreeze. So as I say, I hope you've had lunch. Um, this, is, this is an infographic that I found on the web that essentially has, has, has the same information, just um, formatted slightly differently. Um, something else you may not realize is, is you go to the supermarket, you buy an apple. That apple could be six months old. Um, the food producers have perfected with, with things like apples the art of making them appear fresh and storing them so they appear fresh. However, the nutritional content just goes down very rapidly with time. So you could be biting into a six-month apple that looks fresh and looks crisp. It could have very limited nutritional content in it. So that's something else that, that, that you may not be aware of. So some examples. Um, these are ones, these are sort of mostly pretty well-known ones. Um, the, the olive oil in Spain, um, that actually caused a lot of fatalities. That, that was a very serious um, um, adulteration incident. Diethylene glycol in wine um, in Austria, um, there was a relatively poor grape harvest, and so the wine was going to be rather thin and not very sweet, and someone came up with a bright idea of adding diethylene glycol which imparts some body and some sweetness to the wine, but it's a component of antifreeze, so you know you don't really want to drink it. That probably set the Austrian and, to a certain extent, the German wine business back five years. Again, huge economic damage there. Um, uh, um, Sudan One Dye, which is a carcinogen found in food in the UK and things like potato chips. Um, you've probably heard of the melamine in milk um, um, scandal in China. There's another wine scandal in Italy. Milk is regularly found outside you know, the West um, um, being diluted. Um, some spirits have wood alcohol, i.e. methanol added to them. Um, just a few years ago, there was the um, um, beef burgers that turned out to have a huge proportion of horse meat in it in the UK and Ireland. Um, and um, honey laundering, which is an interesting ter term that I'll talk about you know, in just a second. So um, the Sudan one um, food scare caused, a lot, caused the largest recall in UK food history. And as I say, the Austrian antifreeze, the diethylene glycol in wine, probably set the, the wine economy in that region back about five years. Um, honey laundering, these are some interesting statistics. So in, in, in Malaysia, they produce 45,000 pounds of honey annually. Mysteriously, they export 37 million pounds of honey or stuff alleged to be honey. And so literally, either honey from China or you know, corn oil with various other additives sort of uh, um, um, added to it gets cycled around various geographies and exported, um, and some of it to the US. There's some very high value um, honey out of New Zealand, where again, the statistics are about the same. New Zealand produces X, and mysteriously around the world, 100X of this is sold every year. Um, so, so some general background on small and portable instruments, what you can do and what you can't do, and I really want to emphasize this. So near infrared has been used for a long, long time for broad composition, fat, protein, moisture. There are commercial companies that have lab instruments measuring this in grain um, that, that, that have been established for a very, very long time. Um, when you get to counterfeit foods, if it's fish is also counterfeited, you know, you can grow fish in a pink water and pass it off as something else. That's a genetic test. So that's, a, that, that, that's PCR. So that, that wouldn't be optical spectroscopy. Chemical contamination, if the, con if the concentrations are high enough, you can certainly detect that by various types of optical spectroscopy. Product quality, yes. When it comes to allergens and foodborne pathogens, those are most likely below the detection limit for an optical technique unless you have some kind of enhancement or some kind of separation step in your process. Colors and preservatives, yes, you could look at those by um, near infrared and obviously UV visible. So what does a, and, and let me say this, there are very, very sophisticated lab analytical techniques to detect and quantify exactly what's going on in food. And these are things like LC mass spec, GC mass spec, um, sometimes gravimetric techniques, um, a whole ho and, and slab gel electrophoresis and obviously PCR for, 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 for genetics. However, you can't use that when you open up a container. You can't use those in a loading dock. 
And that's where the potential power of a handheld instrument would, would come in. Um, so there's tremendous value in being able to use a handheld instrument as a screening tool. You, you increase safety, reduce time, increase efficiency, and, and you get the answer at the point of need. So that's the driving force for looking at these optical techniques here. So if you think about most spectrometers, you know, they tend to be two foot square beige boxes sitting on a bench and they produce squiggly lines, they produce data, they produce spectra. Um, they don't necessarily produce results, those have been interpreted by PhD scientists. If you put a, um, a, a, an analytical instrument in someone's hand in the field, it absolutely needs to give answers. That person is not going to be a scientist, they're going to be well trained in something else, maybe an emergency response, but they want an, an immediate actionable answer. They want a red screen, green screen type, type, type answer. And they may be using it if you're thinking about spills um, or, or, or nasty contamination instruments, they may be using it wearing protective gear. So you need to think about that interface as well. So the rationale is if you rapidly deliver actionable information, actionable results at the point of need, you can change the way people do business and you can really improve efficiency a lot. So what do you want to know? You want to know typical things like, is it safe? That could be a spill, that could be a white powder type incident. Is it authentic? And that's, that could be food, that could be counterfeiting high value um, pharmaceuticals or, or consumer goods. What is it worth? Um, so that there are transactions um, believe it or not, the biggest market for a handheld X-ray fluorescence instrument is in scrap metal. And people are going ping, ping, ping and deciding what to pay for, for scrap metal based on an X-ray fluorescence instrument. Do I have probable cause for arrest? That's typically looking at white powders. If someone's pulled over um, and there are suspicious white powders in a baggie, Raman instruments can now look at that and, 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 and give an analysis. You need an instant answer. Um, but you don't need the precision, accuracy, level of detection necessarily of a lab instrument. Often samples, if they are suspicious, will go back to a lab anyway. And what's enabled that? Really two things, the developments in portable electronics, you know, the, the sort of cell phone type um, technology, the electronics, the battery, the display, the operating systems that we all carry around, and then photonics. A lot of um, photonic technologies coming out of optical telecom um, over the past 15 years or so. So as background as to what's available, um, the, the, the first really um, modern practical handheld near-infrared instrument that could give results like this was made by a company called um, Polychromics in about 2005. That company was acquired by Thermo Fisher Scientific. In, in, in the mid-infrared, it's a lot more difficult to do. You tend to use an interferometer, which is temperature sensitive, vibration sensitive. The first instrument, the first portable instrument was a briefcase size instrument made by a company called SenseIR around about 2000, just before 9-11. They did a lot of business immediately post 9-11. That technology is now owned by Smith's Detection. Um, and, and the first real handheld FTIR was developed by a company called Ahura Scientific, which is also now part of Thermo. Um, Raman, pretty straightforward to build. You could build one in your basement, pretty much. Um, you know, 785 laser, a spectrograph, a CCD. Um, the first well-designed, well-engineered instrument with a targeted application built in was developed by um, Ahura Scientific and about, again, a, again, about 2005. You see a common theme here that the initial applications for these were all in safety and security. But once that, that engine, once that um, instrument was developed, um, they, 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 they really moved out into, um, if you like, civilian applications, analytical chemistry applications as well. So w one thing I want to say is you need three things. You need the instrument, you need, you need the underlying technology in the instrument, you need the application, and for, for an instrument company, you need the channel to market. If you're selling to scrap metal dealers, you can't sell that through a channel where the guy is used to going into NIH to sell scientific instruments. He's not going to talk the language that a, a scrap metal dealer understands. Um, so we, we're obviously looking at vibrational spectroscopy if, if, if we're in the um, um, optical space. And so in theory, with, with appropriate calibrations and everything, we can do quantitative analysis and we can do qualitative analysis. In other words, how much of the stuff is there and what is it? 
Um, there are different techniques, obviously. Um, you can operate in the mid-infrared, you can operate in the near-infrared, and you can do Raman spectroscopy, typically with red or near-red excitation, um, but, but essentially visible or near-visible excitation. Um, each technique has its strengths and its weaknesses, and no technique is perfect. Again, you know, people need to realize this. So Raman, for instance, will interrogate quite a small area. It, the spot size of a laser beam might be 0.3 millimeters, maybe one millimeter. Um, so if you're looking at a heterogeneous material, you really need to understand that. Um, Near-infrared can very easily illuminate a large area and interrogate a large area. Raman and near-infrared are point and shoot. You can hold, hold up something and get a spectrum. Mid-infrared, you tend to run by ATR, so you're in contact with a crystal, and you have to worry if your sample is pressure sensitive. Um, Near-infrared and mid-infrared are um, really affected by water and water vapor a lot, Raman not. So they each have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, if we look specifically at um, near-infrared, um, food type samples, food nag samples are normally measured in reflectance without any sample preparation. There's a quite a large number of technologies that are available, but in, in general you're illuminating the sample with a broadband source, you're collecting the scatter light and putting it into some kind of spectrometer or spectrograph um, type, type device. Um, they can be grating devices, they can be Fourier transform, they can be Hadamard devices, um, and, and there are examples of all of those. Um, band strengths in the mid-infrared are strong, um, they're significantly weaker in the near-infrared, but in fact that's a little advantage because then you don't need sample preparation and you can um, look at samples directly in reflectance. So that's actually, it, it sounds like a disadvantage, but it ends up being a, an, an advantage for a practical um, handheld instrument. Um, this, this shows you the, the, um, the band strength on the right in red is a path length in the mid-infrared for a sample of a, of a couple of microns and then a couple of millimeters um, on the left. So, you know, a factor of a thousand in, um, in uh, path length there, um, um, illustrating that point. Um, just just in, in the mid-infrared, if you try to obtain a, uh, a sample, a, a spectrum of a sample of a bulk material by reflectance, um, and if you don't do sample preparation, you can, you can actually end up with very distorted spectra. And in near-infrared, that doesn't happen. So again, that, 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 that's an advantage that pushes a handheld analytical technique towards the, the near-infrared um, area of the spectrum. Um, you can divide up the near-infrared. This should be fairly familiar to the audience in, in, into different areas. The short wave region where you can use a silicon detector, the mid wave to 1.7 where you can use re regular ingas, and then to about 2.4, 2.5 microns where, where you would use so-called extended ingas. And the, 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 the type of instrument might actually change um, depending on the region that you're operating in because of the characteristics of those detectors and the noise characteristics of those detectors. Um, so here, here um, you know, if you go, go, go down the bullets, the traditional lab near-infrared companies and Purton and Fossa, um, examples of that, they don't sell instruments, they sell calibrations. They will sell a wheat calibration. Um, they, they, they sell very specific calibrations for food and ag products and, and their IP and, and um, their, their value is based on those calibrations, not so much on the physical instrument itself. Um, you can transfer calibrations from ins instrument to instrument with a certain amount of effort. Um, I want to talk about sample size because obviously if you, if you think about food products, agricultural products, they're clearly heterogeneous. If you think about pharmaceutical raw material incoming inspection, you're dealing with a very homogeneous white powder, and so you can interrogate a simple spot. If you're thinking about an apple, um, a strawberry, um, any grain product, you just look at it as heterogeneous. So you have to think about the sample size and what you're interrogating. So having, if we've, if we've developed an instrument, we've developed a technology, we really have to understand the sample interface and, and the analytical chemistry portion. You have to know what the, the limitations of the optical system and work within the bounds of the technique here. So as I said, 
Um, if you look at, say, a pharmaceutical raw material, it's probably homogeneous and you can look at a single spot. Definitely heterogeneous materials are natural products, especially food, feed, and ag. And even pharmaceutical solid dosage forms are quite heterogeneous sometimes, and you, 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 you need to be aware of that. And, and so for a homogeneous sample, you can look at a small spot. For a heterogeneous sample, you really need to think about how you're sampling. Are you going to sa sample many spots on the sample? Are you going to put in a sample rotator? Are you going to expand the beam to um, really interrogate the, the whole strawberry, as an example? Um, but, but you need to think about that. And the, the, the classic near infrared applications have been looking at moisture, food, sorry, moisture, carbohydrate, protein, um, uh, etc. in the sample. Um, so the first, first caveat there, for a heterogeneous sample, if you're thinking about a handheld instrument with a miniature engine, you, you, you need to think about throughput. Um, and, and I mean optical throughput here, the area solid angle product. And, and will your miniature engine that can go in a handheld have the optical throughput to do the job. Uh, um, also, if you're looking at a natural product and think of fruit, how much of it are you sampling? Are you just bouncing off the surface and you're sampling the skin? Are you penetrating into the depth of the material? If so, how much? And, and again, that, that sort of fundamental um, optical physics or analytical chemistry knowledge of what, what exactly is happening. Is the composition of the sample the same as the bulk? Um, and when it comes to detection limits, um, you know, probably again, most of the people in the audience are familiar with detection limits for scientific instruments. Um, for, for this type of optical spectroscopy, the detection limits, because of the signal to noise of the measurement and the complexity of the data, is going to be between about 0.1 and 1%. And that's a very important number to remember as you think about what you can detect in one of these um, samples and what you can't detect. If you're doing trace analysis, you need a separations front end. You need a chromatography front end, and you'd be doing GC mass spec or LC mass spec. And in some cases these days, you'd be doing GC triple quad or LC triple quad to really push the detection limits down as much as you can. Um, and, and so, you know, phthalates in plastics, for example, it, it turns out that's actually quite a tricky um, measurement to make by optical spectroscopy. You can sort of just about do it to the detection limit that's, that, that's required, but it's fairly challenging. Um, and so that's just limitation of the technique that you're using. And I'd like to draw your attention to this picture. You know, think of an, analyzing a blueberry muffin. It's clearly a heterogeneous sample. So, you know, can you just point an instrument at it and analyze the blueberry muffin? For its, for its nutritional content. You've, you, you've really got to think about that. There's variation within the sample, sample to sample variation. If you bought a bunch of them at Dunkin' Donuts or something, what happens on a day-to-day on a -day basis or a year-to-year -year basis? Um, so if you want to measure the nutritional content of a muffin, this is a very standard, this is a very standard recipe here. Um, but if you sample where the blueberry is, you're not going to get the fat content. And if you sample where there's pastry, you're going to get high, high, high fat content. So, um, you know, and if the butter wasn't mixed very well, there could be localized domains with, 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 with high fat content. Um, I like, I, I don't know if any of you know the Marty Scorsese movie Casino. Um, <laughs> someone does. Um, the Robert De Niro character goes on a rant. Um, he, he's sitting down with someone, they're having a, each having a blueberry muffin. One is just all solid blueberries, and the other one has one blueberry in it. And he goes to the chef, who looks completely befuddled, and says, from now on, I want an equal number of blueberries in each muffin. And, and the chef is sort of saying, how on earth do you expect me to do that? I don't take how long it takes, just, you know, just, just do it. Um, depending on the eggs you use, medium eggs and large eggs, the fat content is different. And, and now, talking about the detection limits, um, one of the proteins in peanuts that causes allergies is present in the peanut at about 0.1%. So now if you've got trace peanuts in a sample, that allergen is going to be at a very, very low level, but it can still have um, very serious effects for someone who's, who, who's allergic. That's going to be below the detection limit for optical technique. Similarly, pesticides and fungicides, 
those residues are, st uh, are normally studied by something like LC mass spec or GC mass spec. In other words, a, a separation front end and then a very sensitive um, detector. Preservatives can be at very, very low levels. Colorants, you know, they can also be at low levels. So you, you have to know the technique and know what you can, um, know what you can do. So having said all that and, and put that context, what what's out there today and this is just a general survey I'm not um, affiliated with any of these companies or anything so I'm just giving some examples of um, what's out there in the classical food and ag region there are players like Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, there's a UK company called NIR for food um, there are some niche Japanese companies um, near infrared is used for sort of plastics and carpet fiber recycling um, there are companies that that have handheld um, UV vis and IR instruments for field geology and I think I, I, I saw in fact there's just one over there um, um, in, in, in chemical and pharma as I say they're used for things like raw material identification um, and there are many companies with the components and engines if you like obviously ocean optics and companies like ocean optics but people like Texas Instruments Hamamatsu Saiware no, uh, and, and so, I'll, so I'll just outline a few of these. Um, so these are some examples of turnkey portable um, near-infrared instruments. The ones at the top are from Thermo Fisher and ASD, which is now part of Spectris. And, and then there are more like briefcase size instruments that are designed for use in the field. Um, and, and what characterizes them? They're point and shoot instruments, rapid measurement times, one or two seconds. Um, um, typically and some designed very much for sort of farm food and applications some designed for field geology so, you know and, and some designed for um, um, uh, pharmaceutical raw, raw material identification type type areas um, I mentioned the polychromics was the first sort of real one on the market there as a handheld um, that, that's actually a Hadamard device it's got a proprietary MEM spatial light modulator built into it. So it can use a single element detector. Um, and so it's not expending a lot of power, cooling an array detector. Um, um, and, and, and that's a distinct advantage, especially when you go to um, extended in-gas down to about 2.4 microns. Um, the standard instrument is at the top. Again, for food feed and ag, you need to interrogate a larger area. So they modified the optics and incorporated a sample spinner. And that's what those 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 cups are there. There's a recent company called Galaxy Scientific. You know, this is a shoebox-sized um, FTNIR um, uh, uh, designed, you know, designed to go in a portable van and be bounced around and uh, and potentially go in the field. So that's an FTNIR. Um, another FTNIR is Light Light Solutions. This is really specially designed to interrogate very large areas. Um, these are cotton bales that they're looking at here. And, and they want to scan whole cotton bales, which obviously if you're doing that a millimeter at a time is gonna take a rather long time. So they're, 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 it, it's specifically designed to look at large areas of agricultural products. And I offer farm, this is looking at forage. Um, that, there's some interesting instru instruments out of Japan. You may know that you could spend $100 for a melon in Japan, and that's because they individually look after each one and measure the sugar content. Um, and so in terms of engines, um, you know, I mentioned optical throughput. Optical throughput, you need the area solid angle, because that's really going to determine the, the, um, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the ultimate signal noise that you get in the system. Um, and, and so you need to know that um, if you're designing that. Um, and you can always throw, throw that away. You can throw throughput away, but you can't gain it back again if you ever do throw it away. So you need to conserve it all the way through the system um, to, um, 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 to be efficient. Um, if, you, if you've got a low optical throughput, potentially you're gonna have a low signal to noise, and that's gonna affect your detection limit. So you need, need to understand the, the characteristics of your whole of, of your whole system. Having said that, these are some examples of near infrared engines and um, um, and components. And some of these um, folks are exhibiting um, around here. And so I'm just going to sort sort of go over some of the um, 
some of the technologies here because they're sort of interesting. So um, Viavi is a spin out from Ockley and Ockley had developed um, a lot of um, um, linear variable filters during the optical telecom boom and so those are now being, being applied to near infrared spectroscopy and you can see they've got some, some handheld devices typically USB and the one on the bottom left is to, designed to go on a pharmaceutical rotating bin, bin, bin blender so it's wireless and it's battery powered etc. Um, so wavelength range of that device about 950 to about 16 50, uh, because it's a, a, a solid optical device, there are no moving parts and fairly fast acquisition speeds, um, uses a linear variables filter, which is essentially a wedge fabri -Pero. Um And so as you go across the filter, the wavelength it, um, uh, um, it passes is somewhat different. And typically you can cover a little, um, you can cover one octave, um, from essentially with a, um, with a device like that. Um, the Texas Instruments um, engine is very interesting. It uses um, um, a DLP chip, um, um, essentially as a, 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 a Hadamard multiplexing device. So it's, a, so it's a dispersive device, it has a grating in it, and then it's using the DLP engine to do some recombination using Hadamard techniques, which again means you can use a single element detector, but you've got, um, um, uh, you, you, you're putting as much energy on the detector as you can, so you're um, ending up with better signal to noise at the end of it. So, both the TI engine and the polychromics device you can think of as the class of spatial light modulators. The polychromics device is um, more like piano keys, you can think of it as, a, as an addressable grating, and the TI device is obviously a two dimensional um, 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 instrument. Um, spectral engines, um, this is a um, fabri -Pero, um, tunable fabri -Pero in front of a detector. So it's literally just a detector and a little fabri -Pero in front of it. Um, and, and so this is a fairly recent company spun out from VTT, which is sort of the national lab of, of um, Finland. Um, all, these, all these slides, the information is taken directly from the various companies' websites, by the way. Um, um, there's actually a MEMS FTNIR on the market from a company called Cyware. Um, so, um, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so this is a this is a very small um, um, a very small scanning Michelson device um, operating in the near infrared. Um, traditional companies like Hamamatsu have a range of mini and micro spectrometers. So the one on the top left, a fairly conventional looking one, but then ones that are literally about the size of your thumb. Um, uh, um, with, with some fairly innovative um, miniature, um, miniature technologies in them. Um, and actually, um, there's, the, the, there's the MEMS um, FTIR. And there's, there's another, actually, on the bottom left, another MEMS uh, fabri -Pero device, sort of with, with the fabri -Pero directly over the detector. Um, this is another um, one. This is actually a MEMS... Um, tilting uh, uh, MEM scanning grating instrument. So, so there's a cone drive which tilts the um, tilt tilts the grating in this place. And again, a very small in, um, instrument in the bottom right-hand corner. You can see the instrument next to a standard SMA connector. Um, so, some comments um, um, on established near infrared vendors and markets. If you look at near infrared spectra, especially from natural products, food, you see spectra rather similar to the ones on the right. They're rather broad, they're undistinguished, there's not a lot of variation sometimes between them. So there's a lot of, if you like, statistics or chemometrics that's applied in order to take those and really generate, um, and, and really generate data. What that means, and, and I alluded to this earlier, is that the, the IP of a company like that is not in the engine, it's in the calibration, it's in all the effort that's needed to generate that um, that, that, that calibration. And so, you know, typically there are lots of sort of chemometrician statisticians who are really working on these models. Obviously in a handheld you've got to worry about batteries and power dissipation and electronics and interference and things like that. But really the key IP um, tends to be in these calibrations. Um, I wanted to mention, um, um, there's a company called Illuminate, which is a sort of MIT Media Lab spin-out um, startup in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
So they, um, they have funding from Target, um, and so they're really trying to combine molecular spectroscopy, analytical chemistry, deep machine learning, um, massive data handling in order to analyze food and do the, some of the things that I mentioned about tracing food through the whole of the supply chain, looking at how things age, making things sure things are fresh, making things that, uh, making sure they're not um, fraudulent. This is a startup, um, but, but they're committed to a, um, a huge effort in, um, in uh, um, collecting all this data. Um, I want to be a little careful here. There are a number of what I call crowdfunded companies that are talking about very small devices selling to consumers. Um, and I think, they, I think they're exaggerating their claims, put it like that. Um, their, their, their thesis seems to be that users will run spectra of foods and upload the spectrum and the description of the food to the cloud. The problem with this is, again, if you don't really know what you're sampling and how you're sampling it, what does that data mean? And by the way, if you bought your olive oil and you sample your olive oil and it's fraudulent, then you're adding bad data into the database. So I don't think this is a, you know, a reliable method. And at least in the early days on the websites, they had some, what I think were uh, claims that are not really sustainable to detect allergens. Because as I mentioned, allergens can be present in very, very low levels, still cause people problems, but be below the effective detection limit of a small device. And so there are a number of these companies um, out, out there. Again, I've just taken you know, things directly from the um, company websites here. There's, there's this one which is supposed to tell you actually what you're drinking, <laughs> that it's like a little spectrometer built into your cup and it'll tell you what you're drinking. Um, so the application issue, um, and really that's what I've tried to focus on, really understanding what an instrument can do and what it can't do. Um, you, 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 you need to understand what you're sampling. Is, is it the surface? Is it the bulk? Are you sampling a millimeter? Are you sa sampling several centimeters? Um, so you, and, and you know, remember the blueberry muffin example here. And you can't rely on a product label as your reference data. You've got to run the reference chemistry. You've got to analyze a sample by a traditional method that's established by you know, bodies like AOAC. Um, you, you've got to do that to have the, the, the numbers to put into your calibration. Otherwise, you're not going to have a good calibration and it's going to be a garbage in, garbage out type of, type, type of situation. So um, if you look at the literature, there's a whole bunch of um, both books and review articles on firstly food spectroscopy and handheld instruments, handheld instruments for food. Um, uh, there's, there, there's a lot of material that's out there um, you know, that's well worth reading, as well as the books that I mentioned right at the beginning. Uh, one of which, as I say, is an 800-page monograph, very, very comprehensive. Um, I've, I've, the, um, Steve meant uh, in, in the introduction, the, there's, a, there's an SPIE conference, which is at this meeting, Next Generation um, Spectroscopic Technologies. Those um, um, proceedings are worth reading. Um, I was co-editor of a special issue of applied spectroscopy um, la last year on this topic as well. Um, and I, I just put up several of these companies you, you can actually see on the floor here. Um, it's worth looking at you know, the engines and the devices and those guys over there are waving at me. I have no relationship with this company. <laughs> but, uh, um, and um, so uh, in terms of acknowledgements, um, several of the um, um, slides and, and, and materials actually came from um, um, people at um, people at Illuminate, who, who I think are probably taking the best approach to this. And so I hope I haven't worried you too much about what could be in your food and and how it's um, um, I mean how you can detect it. But I hope I've given you an overview not only of what the problem is, um, what what the um, possible solutions are, but also what the boundaries on those solutions are, what you can do and what you can't do with these techniques. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat>